Okay, uh, we are now live. Um, firstly, hi everybody, and uh, welcome to the Terminal Velocity Fan q and I'm joined by John Petrucci, Dave Lura, and Mike Portnoy. Say hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so, obviously, it's been 15 years since Suspended Animation, John, and we finally have a new solo album. Just Has it, really? How does it feel just to have this album just out and, and for people to hear it? You know what? Well, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, Mike and Dave for joining us today. Thank you, guys. Our awesome. pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. And uh, I want to thank everybody else for who's ever watching this. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, it feels really satisfying to have this out finally. <laughs> yeah, D Dave and I have talked about this for <laughs> ever. Like, yeah. hey, uh, when are you going to do that album, John? Every G3 right? tour. That's Every G3 tour, discussion. exactly. So about that album. <laughs> and Mike, Mike, since 2001, I mean, you know, played those first songs with me. We played many G3 shows together. So, yeah, this has been a long, long time coming. So I feel really, I guess, a sense of uh, accomplishment. I finally did it, and uh, I feel really proud of it. Proud these guys are on it, of course. Brilliant. So I guess I guess we'll go straight into the first question here, which is from yeah. Cameron, who sent this in on Instagram. He That's says uh, he says for John, after not playing with Mike for a good amount of time, did you find it difficult to have the same musical connection, or did you find it easy? Oh man, way easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, j just uh, I've talked about this before, but just to kind of describe how it went down, I, I wrote the music and and recorded the guitars, the final guitars and had it all done and written, which I've never done before. Usually, you know, drums go first and you track to that. Um, and then Mike and Dave track to my guitars, which, you know, massive credit to them for making it sound like we're all playing together. I mean, it just has the spirit uh, and everything. But Mike and I, uh, because of that, we didn't actually play together on this. But the cool thing is that because we've known each other forever, we're in the same band for 25 years and i you know i think that there's just a familiarity he knew exactly how to approach my parts and make them work mm -hmm. and it just it sounded like you know no time had passed and uh, it sounded very natural i know a lot of people have responded to that whatever you want to call it nostalgic type of sound but yeah i mean i think there's a chemistry there that you know can't be denied for sure that's brilliant. I mean, given that obviously it's been 15 years since Suspended Animation and both you and Dave obviously played on that record. Um, was there like something like specific that you tried to nail this time around just with regard to the sound? I mean, obviously it's been 15 years. So jump in production obviously is evident when you listen to the album. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I wanted in some respects to, to keep it, uh, you know, like a, almost a companion album to that. So same instrumentation, guitar, bass, bass, drums, no vocals, no added instruments. Um, experiment with different styles and stuff like I did with the first one. But I think, uh, you know, this one taking it further as far as my experience just as a professional mm -hmm. over 15 years and as a guitar player, as a producer, um, I think it's the next evolution. You know, I think the album sounds great. These guys were tremendous on it. Andy Sneap did an amazing job mixing it. Jimmy mm -hmm. T did an amazing job recording it. Um, you know, so everything about it, we tried to, to as much as um, I'm so proud of Suspended Animation, I tried to take this to the next level, you know, but again, keep the focus on this is a guitar instrumental album, make it make it all about the guitar. And, um, yeah. Yeah, and I guess that's I guess that's one of the challenges in creating an instrumental album is like you know um, just trying to sort of like keep the listener focus. And when I listened to Terminal Velocity for the first time, I just I was constantly hooked throughout the whole thing. It just feels like a really cool musical journey. You know, there's always those twists and turns that just keep it exciting and just keep it fresh. Was was that something that you like consciously wanted to do with this record? Just like yeah, have a, definitely have a nice I mean, sense of flow. You know, exactly. I mean, these guys, you know, have done so many different albums and everything it's like they know the importance of the writing part and it's it's guitar instrumental so you know you could mm -hmm. potentially be sort of speaking to a very narrow you know mm -hmm. group of people uh if, if you're not careful you know so for me it's like i try to keep it musical keep it interesting mm -hmm. make sure it's not boring make sure it has <laughs> these different unexpected twists and turns sounds good um yeah. 
you know, that that's definitely a goal. The last thing I want to do is like just make some noodly boring album that mm. nobody wants to ever listen to. I always <laughs> like think about, you know, I don't know about you guys, Mike and Dave, like surfing with the alien or something like you look forward, you know, you want to listen to it. You're going on a drive or something. It's like it, you know, you don't want a headache when you're listening to the music. You want to listen. You want to put it on and have it be something you enjoy. You know? I, I, and if I could, if I could comment from a, an outsider, I think what makes this album so cool and John's approach to it is, like, in in your other musical environments, John, you have to kind of share the role with a keyboard player. Uh, and with a singer, like, you know, yeah. Theater, everything is about the vocals and with LTE, you know, there's, there's keyboards. This is like an opportunity for you to just have the focus on the guitar. You know, there's right. no, there's no keyboards, there's no vocals, and it gives you the full focus. I, and even with the instrumentation, it's like, I could, uh, I love the fact that there's such great rhythm guitar parts on this album. Right. I think that's yeah. something that's probably going to go underappreciated but when you listen to the album there's great orchestration between the guitar parts you know awesome. which you don't really necessarily get to do with LTE or Dream Theater because here, with this you have a essentially a trio but you're kind of playing multiple guitar roles within right. it which is great right. cool mike thanks thanks for uh, pointing that out it, yeah. yeah i'm like uh, it's actually like four guys in the band <laughs> absolutely yeah absolutely <laughs> i i think that um that too well there's a couple of things about that first of all thank you for saying that and uh i think that andy sneep the way he mixed it he made those rhythm guitars kind of stand out in like a very 3d way and when they needed to have like, like that real hair and metal thing so you can separate them out to where the the lead guitars are more vocal and they're out front just like a singer would be um the other thing is that you know dave uh, has had so much experience playing with me it's like the way that he approaches bass parts he's filling out a lot of that trio space too dave i know you're the king of that type of thing um you know where there's not a lot of uh, orchestration you know that's definitely part of it yeah so i got a question for mike um from Haley on Instagram, she says, uh, how did you approach recording your drum parts with Terminal Velocity? Did you try any new approaches in the studio to get the right sound? Well, for starters, um, I should point out for people that don't know, I think most people probably do know the story behind this, but for those that don't, um, you know, John said we didn't play together, like we didn't physically play together because his tracks were done. But I think a real important part of the story with this album is that I did go to Long Island and spent the week with John yeah. doing my drums with us together. So even though his guitar parts were done, you know, we essentially lived together for a, for a week, which was, um, first of all, great personally. It was great to have that, you know, reconnect like that and hang out and laugh together and eat our meals together. But musically as well, we were working on the parts. So they, you know, if there was any questions I had, it wasn't like I was just sitting in my home studio emailing yeah. drum track to him, you know? So even though we didn't physically play together, you know, we did at least work together when I did my drum tracks for that week. And um, I think that really helped get into, um, into the songs better, you know, like John had a little setup in the room with me so if we needed to go through, you know, there's a lot of intricate parts and moments in there. Uh, there was a few parts in particular that were, you know, normally if we were writing together with LTE or old Dream Theater stuff, you know, we'll spend time working on the riff and looping it and playing it slowly, yeah. and speeding it up and getting comfortable. Um, so we had that kind of set up in the studio where we could play together to, to work on those things, even though the guitars were already done. But in terms of approaching the drums and the sound, like you said, I mean, I was walking into... John's world, you know, I never worked with Jimmy T before and he was great to work with. I absolutely oh, yeah. had an amazing time with him. And, and um, you know, he, Jimmy was just not only amazing as a drum engineer and capturing the sounds and working on editing the drums and everything with us, but uh, obviously he's got a great relationship with John and played a big part in the, you know, the, the tracks and the writing and the recording, you know, before the drums were there. So uh, it was it was great to have a working relationship with with Jimmy T, who I had never worked with, and I had a great great experience with him. Yeah, you guys clicked immediately. Yeah, yeah. totally. He's he's amazing. So uh, yeah, and we you know we we spent a whole week there going through the tracks and 
there was no rush. Uh, it wasn't like, okay, we have to get these done in one day and we're done. You know, John was like, let's just take as long as we need and let's get everything to where they need to be. And, and I think, you know, I, I think honestly, John helps push me and inspire me as a drummer. You know, I, 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 I do a lot of records per year at this point, but you know, I have to kind of wear different hats and different styles uh, for, for the different albums and projects and working with John again for the first time in 10 years, you know, it was like we hadn't lost a step. It was, yeah. you know, it, it felt familiar within within the first minute. It was like, you know, the very first thing I played, I guess most people's first thing that they heard was Terminal Velocity, the song. But the first thing we recorded when I got there was um, uh, the, uh, the, what, the Way Things Fall. Oh, that's right. That was the that very was, first thing. Yeah. yeah so and when it you starts with that, all these drum fills. <laughs> when you listen to The Way Things Fall, that yeah, was yeah, literally yeah. the first moment of, you know, me and John recording together in 10 years that was and and it was immediate it felt immediately comfortable it, it felt like not even a day had passed to be honest totally and it was great like um you know i i had sent mike and dave the tracks and and you know mike Kate just came in like totally prepared i mean i was just impressed with how easy going you were about the whole thing but like, you like you probably played the songs like twice like, okay, I think we have it. <laughs> like, okay. But the very the very first time you started playing, and you know, that song you mentioned opens with these kind of big drum fills. I was like, there it is. There he is. It said oh, sounded really? so great. And uh the other thing as far as new recording techniques, we had a Frankenstein drum kit. Yeah. <laughs> a little That's bit. True. I brought I I brought in, you know, because of the pandemic and stuff, it was I guess difficult to get kits, you know. Yeah, Sam, Tama, was, Tama was right. shut down and SIR was shut right. down. We couldn't have something delivered, so. Yeah, so I had uh, a, a while back, Mike helped me get a Tama kit from my home studio and uh, it used it on different projects and stuff at home. But uh, I sent him a picture. I'm like, how about this? He's like, yeah. <laughs> so I loaded it up into my truck and he brought in some other stuff, his snare and some octos and cymbals and stuff. And that was- I brought, in, uh, I brought in my snares, but then I, I brought in one, oh no, two octos which were from the Siamese monster. So they actually have the purple majesty symbol on it yeah. and everything. So, yeah. and then, uh, yeah, there was a little, little bit of everything on that kid. It was definitely a Frankenstein. Yeah, it sounded great though. Again, Jimmy T did a great job. Yeah. Cool. I mean, uh, just talking about the pandemic, um, there was a question where someone asked, um, would the album like even have been made if it wasn't for the pandemic happening? Like, Well, I, I had planned it anyway. So it might not have been made as quickly Mm -hmm. But um, this year, before the pandemic, as far as my schedule with Dream Theater, we did have some chunks of time before, like we had done most of our touring for the last album. And then there was just like an Asian Australia run and we were working on a possible summer run. So I had, like, I saw the year pan out, like, you know what? I have two months here, three months here. If I don't do this in 2020, I, I'm I'm going to get back into like, a busy year in the studio in the next world tour. So I planned it on starting it in March. So yes, it would have got done. Would it have been completed and out? And would we have been, would we be here talking about it having been released last Friday? Probably not. So the pandemic, you know, it gave me the time to, uh, to complete this from beginning to end for sure. All right, so we've got a question for all three of you now. Um, this is from Abel, and he asks, uh, for John, Mike, and Dave, which track proved the most challenging for, for you to record? So we'll start with John. Oh, man. <laughs> start with me. Um, I, there was a track that was challenging for some different reasons, uh, not necessarily technical, but um, I'll explain it. It was the track Gemini. And Gemini is the one track on the record that is like vintage like i wrote it in the early 90s i used to uh use it as um like a guitar demo kind of track some people know this like that saw those maybe saw me at the nam show back then or whatever um and uh it's um you know i would just i programmed the backing tracks on a little sequencer and i'd play along to it and i never recorded it for real i never had a demo of it so but I always knew that I wanted to record it one day. And when I started this project, I'm like, okay, well, how am I going to go about this? I don't have that sequencer anymore. I don't have reference. I had to like scour the internet for whatever the best 
hmm. you know, video somebody had of me doing a guitar clinic and try to listen and learn it from there, you know, deciphering whatever mistakes I made on the guitar. <laughs> like, what did I mean to do and come up with the, you know, the, the current version. So that was the most challenging for me was to put that together. It's interesting, isn't it? Because there are obviously like, you know, parts of material on this album that have gone, you know, that have come from a long time ago. And then there's tracks that you've written sort of more recently as well, isn't there? So that's, yeah, it's, five, it's, it's really, yeah. It's yeah. Really a nice there, blend. Thank you. Besides Gemini, three songs were written over the past few years that I played live with Dave on G3, uh, two of them. And then five of the songs are brand new that I wrote for this, you know, during this time. But I don't know which ones were hard for you guys. You oh, guys I know are all mine. professionals. <laughs> what the name but I don't care. I, for me, right from the get go, I, I heard a lot of tricky things going on. So I jumped into Temple of Cicada right away. Mm, that's all uh, oh, I remember that. You're right. A lot of tricky parts. And then deciphering that was kind of challenging. So I said, okay. And my after listening to the stuff initially, I thought, this is going to take some work. Let me just jump in and start yes. on this. The rest of the stuff I kind of figured out uh, pretty easily, although some of the parts were difficult. But that one was a little bit challenging until you sent me the tempo map and, the, and uh. had the clicks and stuff. And that really clarified it. Um, so that one was tricky. And, and then the one with the 7, 8, 15, 16. And that's it, part of I, Gemini. Yeah, that yeah, yeah that's what I yeah. thought. I, I, I was looking through my charts to try to find it. But yeah, Did that, you, actually, that. somebody asked me if you wrote charts for this, and I didn't really know the answer. So Yeah, yeah I There did. you go. Dave LaRue wrote charts. Yeah. So, yeah, th those were tricky. And if I can just throw in one other thing, stepping back a second, I wanted to chime in on what uh, John and Mike were talking about with Mike playing when Mike came and did it. Yeah. I had started Temple and a, and a couple other tracks before Mike was tracking. I was yes. tracking to the drum machine. And once John and Mike started working together and they started firing off finished drum tracks to me, I just said, oh, well, OK, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's wait for the drum tracks because it just it just breathed so much air into all the tracks and yeah. it made yeah. cutting him so much more pleasant and everything was so much more alive. So. Um, I, I just wanted to add that in. So, what was your awesome. difficult track, Mike? Uh, for me, it's it's a simple answer. There was two of them. There was two that were really difficult. Um, it was Gemini and Temple. To me, those both had uh, really intricate moments. And and like I was saying before, like you know, if John and I were writing together, you spend time working on it. But when you're just throwing this material, some of these moments, there's like this that moment in Gemini. Uh, it's the riff that closes the song, but it appears probably a ma about a minute into the song as well. Yeah. It's like, well, oh, I had to listen to that thing about a hundred <laughs> times. Like, what the hell is that? I'm trying to slow it down and map it out. So yeah. it wasn't until John actually played it for me slow and showed me the phrasing uh, that I can get it. But I I'll say, um, for the most part, you know, there were these drum machine patterns that, that were on the demos. And I right out of the gate asked John, it's like, are you expecting me to like play this exact? Cause I'm not right. really that kind of player where I'm gonna transcribe it and play like exactly like you have it. And he was like, no, 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 do your thing. Just follow it for the for the phrasings, you know, where it's a halftime or an upbeat or a downbeat, just to, you know, where there's double bass. So I would follow the general phrasings, but for the most part, he gave me full reign to just be myself. Uh, but the, there were two moments on the album that I did follow the drum machine specifically. Yeah. And for me, those were th these difficult moments because I'm just not used to, I'm not that kind of a drummer. But, so there was a moment in the middle of Gemini where it's, uh, I guess, the first melodic guitar solo and it has like a, a drum and bass kind of breakdown. Right. Don't, don't, yeah. don't, don't. I and then, and I can see when you're programming that on a drum machine, you know, you could just be random and throw a kick there. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But to actually like learn that and play it and make it feel normal, that yeah. was a challenge. But that was one moment where you wanted me to really learn, right. learn it exactly how you, you had programmed it. And uh, that was a challenge. And then also Temple, the last song in the album, uh, there's a like a pre-verse kind of um, riff. Uh, yeah, really set up. Super tight, like, yeah. It's all in the seventh string, but it was really like very, very intricate, um, very specific grooves and accents that just sounded like you know, how I, I would have never 
have played that on my own. Like, so, right. you know, the fact that you programmed it and you wanted that specifically, that pulled something out of me, you know, that pulled something out of me that I normally wouldn't have played. I would say the same thing for both of these sections in Temple and in Gemini. I would have never played those two sections that way if you hadn't said, no, I really want you to cop that. So it yeah. pulled something out of me that probably would have never have happened on my own. Yeah, and I'm glad you're open and open to that kind of stuff because I, like Mike said, I really wanted him to, you know, just do his thing, like show his personality and bring the stuff to the next level. There were a couple of moments where, I, you know, it, I, it there was a locked guitar pattern that had to happen. And, and those are the ones that are kind of weird to play because, like you said, it's, it's different if you're rehearsing it together and coming up with it. But when you're trying to ingest it after hearing, it's different. Um, another one was the Odd Father, Mike. If you remember the verse rhythm under the verses, yeah, it was yeah. a very specific. And, and I wanted you to do that with the kick drum pattern. Well, but that, the, that felt natural to me because yeah. that felt like something out of like Fatal Tragedy or yes. Under Glass Moon. That was like True. in our wheelhouse you know the sort yeah. of thing so i mean I, I there was a lot of moments where you told me to nail something specific but i'm saying yeah. that, you know most of the time it felt natural but those were those two moments that i pointed out that were very unnatural and that was yeah, yeah. those were huge challenges for me right absolutely very cool yeah i think all that hard work paid off as well because um john you might remember we did that social post uh, where we asked uh, the fans what their favorite tracks were the day yeah. after the album came out and temple and gemini were both at the top of that list in terms nice. of uh, yeah so the fans are really really vibing with those two tracks yeah. in particular so uh definitely, too, definitely yeah. played those are a couple of my favorites as well for sure so, yeah. uh, another thing i've i've been telling people too that i'm so impressed with uh, mike and dave on um guys and maybe you, you could talk about this too is that the, this record you know, the songs that we're mentioning are kind of more in the metal zone, which is like what, you know, you might expect from me um, or in the sound of Dream Theater with Temple and songs like that. But there's also Out of the Blue and, uh, you know, set Latin sections in Gemini and, yeah. uh, you know, like straight ahead kind of stuff and um, Snake in My Boot. And like you guys both just, you know, you shift like it's nothing. Like, okay, you know, we're going to go into like, like a, a shuffle for this you know thing and you just like nail it's not like that's not something that all drummers and bass players just know how to do like i don't know if everybody realizes that out yeah, there right. like some right. people are like kind of like in their own you know headspace like they might be a rock drummer metal drummer or you know jazz whatever it, it's hard to take a jazz guy and say okay now do this like double bass thing and make it sound authentic and vice versa and both you guys totally, you know, you just put on whatever hat is being thrown at you, you know, and it sounds real, like the real deal, authentic thing. So that's Thank amazing. But, I mean, one of the things is the familiarity between the three of us as well. I yeah. mean, obviously John and I played together for 25 years, but Dave is just as important in that equation. Like the three of us did all those G3 tours together, like in mm -hmm. 2001 to 2008 or whatever. And then Dave and I play together in flying colors for all these years. So between the three of us, there's a lot of familiarity in terms of each other's styles. And I think yeah. the three of us really know how to play together, you know, yeah. and, feel, and feel good. I was surprised though, I, you know, when I first got the stuff, hearing the um, the bluesy thing and, mm -hmm. and Snake in My Boot and then, the, and then Gemini with the Latin section. Yeah. I was curious to how you were gonna approach that because we have done a lot of stuff together, a lot of different things, a lot of different stylistic things, but not quite like that. So I, I mean, I knew it would be, I'd have fun with that, but I was curious as to what Mike was gonna do with that. Yeah, and yeah. of course it turned out great. I, and those oh, are, totally. were some of my favorite songs to cut. Yeah, very cool. So, John, it's been uh, 20 years of you being with Only Ball Music Man. You've got some very fine guitars behind you there, I see. I, I do? Wait, I didn't notice. What are you, what are you talking about? You, you, mean, you mean this one or? So we've got a question about just uh, yeah. guitar tones, and this comes from Josh on Facebook. And he says, was there a deep search for different tones on this record compared to projects you did with Dream Theater? Everything sounds like thick chocolate cake on this album. <laughs> well, thank you, Josh. <laughs> I'm glad you noticed the chocolate cake. I mean, it, it's, yes, I've been with Ernie Ball Music Man 20 years, which is unbelievable. Best guitar is on the planet. We've, we've uh, had a really successful line and, and so much fun 
together, me and the Ball family, and it's just been an amazing relationship. Um, over the years, I've been kind of honing in on my own sound. You know, I, I call this my tone mission, which is the name of my company, too, which, you know, everybody has their tone mission, what they're searching for in their head and how to get it out. And I've been lucky enough to develop signature uh, instruments and, and gear with, you know, the stuff that I love the most. Mesa Boogie, DiMarzio, Dunlop, um, Ernie Ball Music Man, TC Electronic. This is stuff I all play and use anyway, like since I was a teenager, you know. Um, so going into this record, we kind of really learned this and honed this in on the last Dream Theater record on Distance Over Time. Just, you know, the guitar amp setup. I mean, it's my Dirty Ball Music Man Majesty into my JP2C signature boogie head, 4x12. Mm -hmm. we, we found the, the perfect combination of microphones and Neve preamps. And uh, it, we just nailed it. It's like the search is over. What's that song? What was that band? The search <laughs> is over. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's 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 all those pieces put together to create you know the sound that I was looking for. And uh, you know Jimmy T did a great job capturing that. It's it's very simple. It's guitar plugged into a head and mic'd. It's old school, but it's man, there's nothing more pure than, than that. And um, it's also you know, mentioning the different styles on the record, it's a, the gear is able to deliver all those things. Like mm -hmm. Out of the Blue has like a real bluesy kind of almost Carlos, Gary Moore sort of sound. I, I didn't change gear. I didn't pick up another guitar, a different head. It's the same. Just head. goes to show how versatile they can be. Yeah. yeah. Same, yeah. same, same gear as, a, you know, Temple of Circadia riff, which is just a seven string through the same head. So it shows that versatility. So I'm very, very fortunate. Uh, but thanks yeah. for the chocolate cake. This one had a little, <laughs> little bit more icing, maybe some sprinkles on top too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Dave, um, you obviously use the uh, the bongos as well, uh, the bongo basses. Yeah, it, um, it, we had a all, question. Uh, it's an all Music Man record. That's right. You, <laughs> it you is, got yeah. a, bunch, a bunch of a bunch of bongos in the background there. Yeah, I got a, a bunch Look of that. <laughs> Yeah, I got a, I got a question from uh, I got a question from Keith on Facebook, and he says uh, he says um, did you use like a specific model on terminal velocity? And he also asked, have you have you checked out John Myung's new signature model? No, I actually just heard about that. I was teaching last week, and I heard so, something about that. It seemed pretty wild. But uh, yeah. this is the bass I play on um, terminal velocity on all the tracks. And it's actually the one I was on tour with with John and I, I played it on the Flying Colors tour too. This has been my main five string for a while. So it's just the, the you know, Music Man standard five string bongo, HS. Um, but I just love the way this one plays and it sings everywhere across the neck. The low strings are real, the low notes are really fat, but still nice and clear up on top. So it's just, it's nice acts for recording. But this, this I played everything on this bass. That sounded killer, man. And, and uh you know the way we did this you know because of the pandemic and everything mike doesn't live too far from me but dave's in florida i'm in new york so dave did everything remote and uh at his studio and got a great tone and you know w one of the things i love dave about your sound and your approach is that when you're doing like the lower stuff like you said where you're doubling some of the riffs it's like right on tight the fast stuff is right there but then when you're doing the the more melodic stuff like in uh the tempo breakdown or some lines in out of the blue you have that real you know melodic beautiful sound on the bass as well so Thanks, that's thank amazing you. that's it should be it should be pointed out that john only plays with music man bass players David yeah, Rudy, right. John Mayall, and tony levin all three of his bass players that's right you have to play music man in yeah. order to uh, be in the project with me and while we're showing off guitars this was like the main uh <laughs> <laughs> the main guitar on the album. This is my um, majesty. We call this the purple nebula is the color. I just call it nebula and it's just beautiful. It's like a space oh, nebula. Is. Yeah, these these are neck through guitars. Mike, you play these while we were here. They're like oh, so man. easy to play, right? Amazing. You're like, what? what is this magic? What is this sorcery? I want one. I want one. <laughs> All right, I'll get you your, one. I have one of your old Picasso ones here, so I, need, I definitely right. need an upgrade. All right, you probably still like purple, right? Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> that's awesome. Cool. Absolutely. All right. Mike yeah. Mike Portnoy is getting a new 
purple nebula majesty you want seven <laughs> string or six string six I, I i actually i think i have a seven of yours so six ah okay come to that <laughs> you've heard it here first <laughs> I thought it'd be worth mentioning as well, just uh, the contributions of um, Andy Sneap and Jimmy T in terms of production on this album, because I mean, it does just sound incredible. I mean, like the guitars, bass, drums just all jump out of the speakers, like, especially if you run this album on a decent stereo. I mean, it just it sounds incredible. And I think like the work that those guys did to really bring your performances to the fore, you know, is, is so evident on this album. It really no, I'm is. glad you think so. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, Jimmy T, um, you know, working with him. I was just talking to him because he actually, uh, not to get off topic, but Dream Theater has a live DVD coming out and he mixed it. It's the first time he mixed a project for us. And we met Jimmy T when he was an assistant engineer at Cove City. Uh, and and uh, he's risen up in the ranks and you know we're all so proud of him, but he uh, engineered this, did a beautiful job. As Mike said, you know, so easy to work with, great editor, great uh, you know, engineer. And then Andy Sneap, this was my first time working with Andy, and he was awesome to work with. He's in the UK, where you are, Rob. Yeah, just like me. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we did everything uh, via FaceTime, and Andy was, like, just so generous with his time, you know, uh, uh, sending mixes back and forth. And he masters as well. So, like, we were able to kind of, like, do that process hand in hand. If something wasn't right in the mix, he can go back, remaster. Um, and he just has an amazing body of work in what he's done uh, as a mixer. He's a great guitar player. My wife, Rain, and I saw him uh, with Judas Priest not too long ago. So really great working with Andy. And uh, he liked my amp so much, I sent him one as a gift to thank him. <laughs> so uh, yeah, he, what, what, a, what a great guy. And uh, both those guys, yes, hats off to the two of them. Fantastic. So we've got a question from uh, from Yuan on Facebook who asks, uh, after the pandemic, would the three of you consider taking Terminal Velocity on tour? That would be an absolute dream come true. Oh man, that would be fun. Sure. Absolutely. It, it's Absolutely. Like... I mean, it's John's calls, John's music, but man, I, <laughs> I would love to. As, as, Mark Snyder Snyder says, as Mark Steiner says, come down. <laughs> 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 Definitely. <laughs> uh, you know it's like we're all kind of, we're all kind of in the same boat right guys it's like we don't know when touring is gonna <laughs> right yeah you know, it's a, it's a crazy again. situation yeah it really, it's really is. Crazy. and then once it opens up it's it's going to be crazy again every you know everybody's yeah. going to be getting out so it'll be the old mystery of the schedule or the puzzle right. of the schedules when we can exactly. do it but yeah it would be great to get out there and play with this music it would be fantastic yeah. the good thing now i'm finally a catalog artist as a solo <laughs> I have other songs to play besides uh, um, Glasgow Kiss and <laughs> Damage Control. Well, it's funny because I last time I did G3 with you, I was playing all those songs from the first album. Yeah. But I didn't play on that album. Right. You know, so. Yes. I would, I, and, and I would love to. That's totally true. And, and just so people know why, um, I just had this, this, like, my own rule. Like, I wanted my solo stuff to be separate from Dream Theater stuff. And so, uh, you know, it, that's why back then it didn't work out. That's why now it did work out. On the same topic as that, we had a question uh, from James on Facebook. He said, uh, he said, for John, when you write your solo material, are you free to experiment than say you would when writing a song for Dream Theater? Or do you set yourself limits to stop your ideas getting too insane? Huh. I, I definitely... I definitely don't set limits. It's just a different kind of, a little bit different headspace because, mm -hmm. um, you know, my solo album stuff, I'm, I'm just trying to show all the different sides that I like to do as a guitar player and have fun with that I don't necessarily do in Dream Theater that would fit with that. So you're not going to hear Out of the Blue or Snake in My Boot and things like that uh, on a Dream Theater record. So it's a little bit different headspace. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, like Mike said earlier, the orchestration is simpler. So I'm kind of just taking on, on all the roles of, of playing all the solos all the melodies and rhythms mm -hmm. so yeah a little bit different headspace but uh, i don't hold myself back i try not to um <laughs> you know i don't know <laughs> i think that would uh you know just let it all out it's a solo album exactly yeah yeah and speaking about uh, i'm sorry to interrupt you but uh, i just want to show you guys out there so this is uh 
Mike, you've seen these before, right? Yeah. Test, test pressings. Do you, do you listen right. to these a lot? Yeah, I, I believe it or not, in my office, I have the one, uh, I still have uh, images and words test pressing. Do you really? I, That's I went so cool. Day night, yeah. Wow. Yeah, but I can't wait to hear that. I can't wait to get this on vinyl. Yeah. It's sold out before I could buy one. Don't worry, I got one put aside <laughs> for you <laughs> thank you man. thank you yeah but the uh in fact uh i i just, you know have a great system here at the studio and listen to the uh, vinyl test pressing last week sounds phenomenal um yeah so i'm excited about that so that that kind of brings up a little bit um you know this was released digitally and streaming fr on friday um but the vinyl and cd won't be available until october 30th but you could pre-order it now uh it's a little bit different way of going about things but uh, i just i you know i talked to these guys about this i just wanted to get the music out and share it because here we are you know there's nothing else to do the yeah. pandemic and you know let's enjoy the music and yeah. and uh it's all about that so you know people that do want the physical version you can still get it just for october 30th i applaud you for that i think that was a great move i mean it Thank was you. uh it may not be the you know the the ideal kind of business scenario, but I appreciate that you put the music and the fans first and, and yeah. wanted to get it out. I mean, I, I would go nuts having to sit on this album till right? you know, two more months. <laughs> yeah. I know. So, yeah, no, I mean, I'm really, really glad you did it yeah. this way. So cool. yeah, I, thanks. I, I agree totally. Thank you. So we got a question from Cole on Facebook, and he says, "This is for John and Mike. Did I hear you both laughing on Snake in My Boot? It ah. sure sounded like it." <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell that story, Mike? <laughs> yeah. But, um, I guess I, I had no, we were, I was tracking the drums for that. And at one point, uh, John came into the studio with, with a cowbell doing his, his Will Ferrell, you know, he was exploring the studio space and yeah. um, I, he was so, did the cowbell part make it or just the laughter? <laughs> the cowbell is in the mix. Okay. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we so did. You can hear John playing cowbell and yeah. then we both cracked up and um, actually there's a video of that. There is video of Next that. Next time you're talking, I'm going to look at my phone and see if I can find the video of you running in and laughing. Oh, you got it. You got to find it. But we were cracking up and and uh, it made it onto the album. Yeah. That we that was a cool section. So just as an aside, like Snake in My Boot, um, Dave, you know this. I mean, it's really just a blue. It's a one, four, five, really. Um, but on the, on the five chord, I tried to just throw in my own, you know, personality and make it more like modal on that five chord um and so we kind of had this idea when tracking the drums like we should overdub drum percussion and stuff and the idea was to make it sound like a drum circle type of thing so mike played the normal groove and then he did one overdub of like low toms on one side one overdub of low of high toms on the other side and when he was doing those overdubs is when i walked in and started playing the all right let's you go to the videotape Oh no, <laughs> I have it. So check it out. Oh, it's video of video. Yeah, a video of a video. Here we go. Hey! hey. That's so funny. <laughs> and we weren't wearing masks. We were, we we were, we were very careful. It was literally, I mean, for anybody that's wondering about that, it was it was just me, John, and Jimmy T for that week, and uh, you know, yeah, we, we were, were close. Very very careful, and, and yeah. uh, you know, yeah, we, we don't want people to think we're irresponsible. No, <laughs> we, we were wearing fact, masks. We were, yeah. The two of us actually, uh, I think you said that was the first time you kind of left your house, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think so was, we, uh, this was probably the end of April we did this, the drum sessions. And right. uh, so, yeah, we were, I, I had been in my house for six weeks at that point. So, yeah, yeah. it was nice to just get out. And yeah. I haven't left since. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, we've got another track here from, uh, from CS Brown on Instagram. Uh, this is for John and Dave. Um, did you track your leads and solos with any effects on, or did you add them all in in post? Uh, this is for Dave too, as he does have a bass solo in there. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I might as well do mine first because it's pretty quick. I, I cut everything dry so that uh, we could deal with it in post-production on um, 
they can add in the mix whatever they wanted to do because uh, everything was still coming into focus at that point so and we and John and I went back and forth about a couple times about that section in the middle of uh, Temple so we kept adding things to it and John ended up with this great section of, with with a bunch of my parts there and his parts but um, so I didn't affect anything ahead of time the only thing I did track with was a, a couple sections I used a dark glass uh, pedal compressor to bring out a, a couple lines that I was fighting with and a couple weird tap things that came out and I just like it just wasn't working so I, I would put that on I was like eh, okay now we're getting a, a little more evenness and what I was looking for but that's really the only effect I used uh, when tracking yeah I think as a general rule of thumb like you'll agree to this Dave I'm sure you know, any, any sort of front end pedal effects, uh, you know, it's fine to track with, you know, because it's sort of affecting the performance and the interaction of the, the mm -hmm. sound with the speaker and everything. So it could be a compressor pedal, a wah-wah pedal, a, a right. phaser pedal, whatever. But any, any of the, uh, you know, for the solos, when you hear those delay, those big stereo delays, I'm not tracking with that. No, I'm tracking dry and those are all added in post by the mix engineer. A lot of that stuff, Jimmy T and I dialed in and shared with Andy and Andy used a bunch of that too and then also made his own decisions. Um, so you have a lot more freedom if you record dry, just general rule of thumb and you can add any of that stuff afterwards. Yeah, um, and things, yeah. things that are recorded with the, uh, the initial track can really start to get in the way later. Yeah. And you can't undo it. You know, so, you can't undo yeah. it, right. Well, I mean, a lot and of times, I'll cut solos and I'll monitor a delay or something just to sure. uh, make the performance feel better. Like I, do like that I, might, all the time. Like I yes. might do live. I'll put a little verb on it and have it have a delay if I'm playing like a melodic solo, but yeah. I won't I won't commit it to the recording. Exactly. I'll just do that for my benefit and send the dry track on. Right. I mean, it's, it'd be like a mixer's worst nightmare is to get all of, you know, imagine all the drums had reverb already and you couldn't <laughs> right, change right. it, you know? All the right. guitars had delay and you couldn't adjust the level. You don't you don't have a you don't have a, a perspective of how it's going to sit in the mix when you're actually just tracking it. So yeah. it's better to record dry. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, we're coming up to I think we've done about forty five minutes now, so I think we'll have a couple more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Um, right. But uh, I've got a good question here. This is actually asked by a lot of people. Um, obviously, John, as I manage your sort of online channels, I, I see everything. And uh, this this mm -hmm. question got asked a lot which is, um, is there going to be a new tab book for the album? I imagine there'll be a lot of a lot for everyone to study um, uh, if they want to learn the parts. Yeah, we'll do a tab book. I, I, I know uh, great guys that do that, that do all the Dream Theater work and do a phenomenal, incredible job. They actually reached out to me early on. I wasn't quite ready to, to uh, explore that yet, but definitely we'll do it. I'll hi yeah. hire those guys. They're... Uh, unbelievable transcribers and um, we'll make that happen. I just, I don't know when my focus was getting the record out and the music. So we'll do a tab book for sure. Fantastic. Do you, John, do you, do you check all that stuff once they've um, kind of laid it down on paper? I don't check, honestly, I don't go note for note and check it. We'll, <laughs> we'll have some detailed conversations about certain sections, okay. uh, fingerings, things like that. I said, yeah, that's what I was wondering. Uh, yeah, I send them the isolated guitar tracks so they they don't have to pick it out of the mix. And mm -hmm. it's like they can tell what string I'm playing on. Like, okay, yeah. they're brilliant. Like, I stopped checking a while back because I know, like, they're, it's going to be right. exactly 100% yeah, cool. spot you know, on. That, yeah. that could be tricky. I mean, I did one yeah. book and got the tab back and it was totally wrong. Right, the, right. The, the, the notes, the, um, the, the sheet music was correct, but the tab was all off. Oh, so wow. Had, I had to go through and say that those aren't open strings, you know? Yeah. Yeah. They, they would they, do the default fingering. No, that's not good. Th these guys would never make that mistake. They're like, yeah, great, great, I, yeah. it, it's mind blowing how they transcribe the, the stuff, yeah. but you know, it's unbelievably accurate. A long time ago, Mike, I don't know if you know this, but uh, I did the transcriptions for the images and words guitar book. And that was a undertaking. That's <laughs> a lot. And that was like without the software too. <laughs> It's all like handwritten, so. <laughs> Writing. Wow. I deferred you to figured the if, if You figured if I could do it, you could do it, right? Right, exactly. I did yeah. all those early transcriptions for Zappa. That's right. And, I mean, that's that's a there's an art to you know doing that for sure. Oh, totally. 
a talent. You know, you got to, it's a lot of work. It is. Exactly. It is a lot of work. So yeah, I let the guys that do that. Great. Do it. And yeah, I can assure you it's like a hundred percent accurate. No doubt. (laughs) All right. So last question. And this, this is for all three of you, um, which is if you had to pick a single track from terminal velocity that you personally really enjoyed working on, what would it be? And why that's from Chris on Facebook. No, I'll let you guys answer first. Well, I'll go ahead and go. Um, I, I really enjoyed Temple, and it was the first track I worked on. So I, I enjoyed a lot of the stuff later too. I enjoyed Out of the Blue a lot. That was just that was just cool and fun to to really just be worrying about feel and not not all the technical stuff that presented itself in so many of the other tracks. But uh, you kind of what Mike alluded to earlier, Temple was challenging and and some things were done differently than i might have thought of them so i i had to stretch a little bit and uh and and figure this all out and then execute it and it was a, and it was a nice mix of um really understanding the tune challenging parts and then there was the nice breakdown in the middle where there was more textural stuff so it was really cool in that regard to me. i really liked everything that that tune did so it was a lot of fun to do awesome well he did a great job (laughs) (laughs) yeah i i have to agree with dave temple i mean like i already said gemini and temple were to me the most challenging um and i really do love temple it reminds me a lot of uh some some of the great elements of the dream theater stuff that john and i did together so it's got a lot of that i love the heaviness of it i love the, the shifting feels uh after that middle section breakdown i love the the, the build up with the drums going between the 16th notes and the triplets constantly shifting that was a challenge and then the ending is like so heavy it's got all this kind of mega death kind of glass prison shredding but being that dave already picked temple i'll uh my other favorite one on the album is the odd father so i'm gonna pick that one because that that's another track on the album that has so many elements and uh so many familiar elements for me and John, um, you know, that just remind me of all the stuff we've done together through the years. Uh, so yeah, that's, I'll, I'll go with The Odd Father. Uh, it's definitely one of my favorites, but it changes from, from day to day. I, I really, I think every song in the album brings something else to the table. I think they're all great. They all showcase all three of us, um, but yeah, I love them all, but I'll go with The Odd Father. Nice. Well, as I said to Dave, killer job on all that stuff mike beyond above and beyond <laughs> you, you i don't know if you you cut out a little bit but i think i don't know if that was me you um but uh I, i'll be different and just as a guitar player one of the ones that was really a lot of fun you could probably hear it that was really enjoyable uh for me was snake in my boot because it was so different the idea is that it's just a single guitar track throughout the whole song I, I break from that rule a little bit with a couple of overdubs during the five chords, but it's the idea was just have this kind of Van Halen 1984 guitar sound and, uh, and play it, you know, just go from rhythm to lead back to rhythm to lead one guitar track, uh, not doubled, not uh, overdubbed. And um, so, and it's more of like in, in a rock old school kind of way, you know, Brian May, Satriani, that kind kind of thing even a little bit of uh jimmy page it just has that old rock and roll early like rush you know some of the mm-hmm. early like first album second album rush riffs that alex did so anyway that's one of my favorite kind of more fun songs on the album would be snake in my boot definitely Brilliant. yeah all right well i guess we've come, we've come to the end unfortunately oh man <laughs> i know yeah <laughs> that, that flew by like two seconds yeah <laughs> all right well, thanks to all, all the fans who have tuned in and uh, have put comments in, 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 in the stream. There's been so many to, to go through. Um, they've just been flicking past on my screen here like crazy. Um, wow. But just, I guess we just have to remind everyone, uh, Terminal Velocity is out now on all streaming platforms, uh, all digital download platforms, and it's coming out on CD and vinyl. John, you've got the test pressing there, haven't you? <laughs> I do, oh, and yeah. everything is sounding great. And I want to thank you, Rob, for organizing this organizing this and doing this i want to thank mike and dave for spending this hour with me uh today and for doing such an amazing job on the album i love you guys you guys were incredible on this thank you and thank thank you to all the fans that uh all the fans that tuned into this and have been i've been reading the comments and stuff and it's just wonderful to see like such a positive reaction to this music and this release so thank you 
I don't get a chance to really thank all of you. So I'm thanking you as much as I can right now. It's awesome. Awesome to see that. Very cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. All right. Me. Goodbye thank now. Bye-bye. guys. See you. <laughs>